you all uh, very much for coming this afternoon to the South Entire Study Seminar. I'm going to introduce uh, my friend and colleague Bridget Brown, and Bridget's going to then go to introduce the rest of the, of the panel of, of her colleagues uh, from St Mary's University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. I met Bridget a few years ago, um, uh, and uh, she introduced me to the project that she's been coordinating uh, for the University of St Mary's for a number of years. Uh, in association with Peaceful Schools International. So we're just going to uh, tell us a bit about the, the kind of overall philosophy of, um, of Peaceful Schools International. And that's specifically the project <coughs> we've been carrying out here with schools in Belfast uh, on conflict transformation. Um, you've been running it since 2005? I don't know, earlier than that? Yes. Yeah, so more, for more than 10 years, there have been groups of Canadian students coming here and being... Um, Allocated into into uh, positions in Northern Irish schools, uh, particularly Belfast schools, of a range of different types: Catholic schools, Protestant schools, Gael schools, integrated schools, uh, and in carrying out projects with the pupils uh, on conflict transformation uh, within education. Um, so I've probably said it. I'm going to pass over to Bridget, okay, who's going to introduce the rest of the panel and then take us through the outline of what the staff are doing. Okay, great. Well, can we move this down? Yes. Oh, good. Great. That makes it easier. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for coming on a Monday afternoon at 4.30 um, to listen to our talk. We're grateful for your interest. Um, as Peter said, uh, the project is in its 13th year with our uh, collective effort, although the origin story for the con uh, connection between um, St. Mary's University and Nova Scotia started in 2001 with the Holy Cross um, protests that took place here. So it is a bit of a more long-standing than just 2005. Um, I will introduce my colleagues. Um, to my left is Emily Anderson, who is the, really the senior program coordinator and um, facilitator of all details relevant to the project. Um, Emily, let's see who uh, is also the Vice President of Peaceful Schools International and, um, and again, the Senior Coordinator of this program. Next to Emily is Dr. Ashley Carver, who is an Assistant Professor in the Department of Criminology. Um, seated next to Dr. Carver is Dr. David Bourgeois, Associate Professor and Undergraduate Program Coordinator, Department of Psychology, and next to uh, Dr. Bourgeois is Dr. Lachlan, Dr. Catherine Lachlan, who is um, our Canada Research Chair, Associate Dean of Research and Knowledge Mobilization in our Department of Management. So all of these individuals um, have played a key part and will continue to play a key part in the uh, facilitation and implementation of this program. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, I mentioned that this began with the whole, the connection began with the Holy Cross situation in 2001. And essentially what took place was, because that incident was featured on the world's media, we were seeing it in Nova Scotia, and the founder, I'll explain Peaceful Schools International to you in a moment, but the founder of our uh, non-profit partner, Peaceful Schools International, picked up the phone and called the principal at Holy Cross and asked if there was an interest in some form of support and collaboration. And there was. So the relationship essentially began there. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that we're actually in our second year working with Holy Cross Girls School this year. So it's come full circle from, from that time. Um, then we'll look at some of the program specifics, so help you understand how the program comes together each year and who's involved and what the criteria are and selection process. Emily will speak to some of that. And then the academic focus. So we have um, various academic areas of interest and relevant academic connections to the students in this program. Uh, and my colleagues will speak to that, and then we will be pleased to answer any questions. Okay? Uh, so first, a small photograph of our university, founded in 1802, founded by the Irish Christian Brothers. Um, we are now, we have... We're a mid-size university, approximately 8,000 students. Um, we have the highest number of international students of, of, you know, per capita of any university in Canada. So we have a, a very um, significant focus on internationalization. 
uh, the university uh, primarily focuses on undergraduate and graduate programs and uh, very much is uh, supportive and encouraging experiential learning and global citizenship. So there's been support for this program um, at all levels of the university really from the onset. So from our president and vice chancellor to our deans, administrators, faculty, and obviously students. Peaceful Schools International, um, which is again our nonprofit partner organization, um, was started by a woman in Halifax, in our city, in 1991, after the tragic death of her son, who had been a victim of bullying in school. He was 14 at the time, and she herself was a principal and educator, and had gone to the school to try and see if they could resolve the issue that was happening with her son, and unfortunately, um, he was attacked by the boy who had been um, bullying him and a couple of days later uh, passed away as a result of his injuries. So she decided for the rest of her career, she's, she's here with us in Belfast and, and in fact was the woman who called Holy Cross in 2001. Um, her name is Dr. Hetty Van Gerp. Uh, she decided that for the rest of her career and her life she was going to dedicate to the promotion of peace education in school. So the organization is non-prescriptive. Uh, we provide resources and support to schools who have dedicated some degree of interest in promoting peace education. So we don't really care exactly what you're doing or how you are doing it, but the fact that you are doing it is what's important. So I think we have 380 schools worldwide. Many of them are in Belfast, and many of them are long-term partner schools. And so the students, that's a picture of some of our students on our sports field um, at the university. And you know, our, our vision would be to continue to grow and develop the organization in collaboration with the university and to encourage more universities to become involved in this type of programming. That's all I have to say about peaceful schools. So, Program specifics. So I will just say a couple of words and then I'll pass it on to Emily. So uh, one of the most important features of this program is that it's accessible. So students at St. Mary's was, is traditionally a working class university. Uh, many of our students certainly would never have the opportunity to travel or experience any type of international experiential programming. So the program is uh, primarily facilitated through fundraising and it's open to students in all three faculties, so art, science, and commerce. Um, and that's very important uh, to us, though there are many students in Irish studies, and certainly they uh, take part in the program. Um, we think that it's important that it's accessible to all students um, and all income levels. And I think maybe I'll pass it to Emily now. Sure. Uh, so our application process starts every September. Students are required to apply to our program and then they are interviewed. Um, this year we had over 60 students apply and we were able to bring 28 students with us. Um, the program begins early October and we meet every single week um, for at least two hours. And during that time we um, discuss the history of Northern Ireland, um, look over current issues that are happening so the students come in informed. Um, we also build our peace education workshops, um, which students are trained on various um, peace education techniques such as empathy building, conflict resolution, effective communication. Um, students build this one hour workshop and we go into our local schools. So this year we worked with seven local schools um, where they practice the workshops in Halifax. Um, in addition to that, we are um, constantly uh, organizing our fundraising activities so that the students, so it is an af affordable program for all students. Um, and I'm trying to think if I'm missing anything else in terms of the structure. Structure students would have to maintain, you know, a certain level of uh, GPA. So mm -hmm. they're, um, we, we're not looking for students who are top students at all levels, um, but certainly a mix of students at different levels. We have graduate participants, so students in graduate programs have participated. Some students have completed their graduate theses on this program or in relation to the program. Okay. Um, 
And uh, as the program has grown over a number of years, what has emerged from it is now um, our Senate has approved a minor in peace and conflict studies. So that's been a, a really fantastic, tangible outcome directly associated with this program. And also, you know, in, in terms of relationship building, we've been able to build relationships with, we'll show you the, the program in more detail, with many schools in Belfast over the years. Uh, who have been most welcoming, and within our own community. So we see it as a win-win that the students are giving back locally first, and then taking these same messages. We're not, humility is a huge part of the introduction to um, participating in this program. We're not sending students here as, um, uh, with the mindset that they're here to fix anyone's problems, or that they know the answer to anyone's problems in Northern Ireland, but simply that they're here to <coughs> share. Um, their experience, strength, and hope with students here. And that's been very well received at all levels. Ashley? Oh, here's the program. So this is an example of the program for this year. All right, so you can see we also try to balance um, making sure students have access to um, both loyalist and Republican <coughs> Uh, connections. So we spent this morning with um, Charter and I, uh, Loyalist Ex-Prisoners Association, so they would meet with these folks first. Then they, uh, we spent the afternoon at Taranal. And again, we've developed over the years relationships with these individuals who help share their experiences with the students in a very different way than years and years ago we used to go to Stormont and um, found that, while well, that was interesting, uh, for the students it was not quite as real as we want them to experience in terms of what people have gone through within this society. So this seems to be a bit of a better fit. So they start the week off that way. Tomorrow we have seven teams of students, so the students work in teams of four. We have seven teams, and they will be working in schools all day for the rest of the week. Um, two Irish medium schools, two integrated schools, a number of Catholic maintained schools, and a number of state schools. And did I say integrated schools? Two integrated schools. So one of the great connections in meeting Peter was Peter introduced me to his sister-in-law, who then is a vice principal at an integrated school. We made the connection, we're warmly welcomed, and we're back again. So this seems how it, the, the ability to form relationships here, develop um, strong references for our connection, seems to work very well here. We also are limited in the terms of our travel to Belfast because we, we go during our reading break, break, our reading break, and that doesn't always coincide with the school breaks here, so because they're different every year. So it's very important that we have a roster of many schools so that when we arrive we're not limited to just a few schools. The students work very, I mean, their main focus is to work with the children in the schools. So um, the more schools we have on our roster here, the better. So you can see it's quite a variety. And the children, I mean, this isn't just an effort in um, trying to provide some peace education information. It's also an intercultural exchange. So the children are very interested in the Canadians. Most of our students are Canadian, so this year we would, we would always um, make sure we're trying to have a, a most diverse team of students. So we have a student from Brazil this year, a student from Zimbabwe, and another student from India. India. And so the children here, while they, they seem not so exotic at home, the children here see our students as quite exotic and are really interested in learning just basic cultural differences and sharing, you know, sharing things that way. So that's another benefit that, that we found. And the principals and teachers that we've connected with here are very keen. I mean, really the willingness for this program to succeed is fundamentally based on the leadership within the individual schools. And that's true for us in, in Canada as well. So we, we go where we're most wanted. So. There's, there are many schools who are very grateful for this, and that's where we want to be. So any questions about the schedule? 
can see it clearly. Yes? Um, what are the, the Monday activities that are quite interesting? What's happening there? Um, so, well, we spent this morning um, in East Belfast at the Andy Tyree Conflict Museum, sort of a museum, um, and spoke with two um, members of that organization who are ex-paramilitaries, um, UDA. They provided the students with their narrative and their description of what has happened in their community. And uh, so this is all very interesting and informative for the students. And then we spent the afternoon doing the same thing um, with Republican representatives of the Republican community, again, ex-paramilitaries, um, and very keen to share their experience and you know, their version of the narrative for the students. So they get a sense, a much better sense, prior to going, because the schools we're working with are primarily located in North End and West Belfast. So it really helps our students, I think, establish a foundation of a better understanding from people within these respective communities. And then also seeing where they're cooperating as well. So one of the gentlemen this morning was going to a meeting at the Republican um, Ex-Prisoners Association later today to meet with his counterpart there to talk about the same issues and you know, how to help ex-prisoners reintegrate and, and whatnot. So they're seeing, we're also seeing efforts at collaboration at that level. And is the afternoon one in East Belfast as well? No, in West. Yeah. The afternoon one is at Conway Mill. Yeah. The organization being called Koista and the building actually is Taranao. The name of the building is Taranao. So that's day one. And we also involve, uh, for the last few years, we've involved the PSNI. We have asked the PSNI to come and speak with the students and explain their perspective, their challenges, their, and they have been incredibly um, open to that. And the students find that very valuable as well. Any other questions about that? schedule for in the No? Okay. Academic focus. So we'll move on to Dr. Carver. who will speak to his role. Yeah, I'm uh, Dr. Ash Carver. I'm with the, Dep well, Faculty of Arts. Uh, I work in the Department of Criminology. Uh, I am bad cop on the trip. Um, I try to prepare the students for the reality of coming to Belfast and um, uh, the realities of, of visiting a conflict zone. Um, I've lived in conflict zones in the past in the Basque country in, in Spain and in Guatemala. Um, so I'm, I'm quite aware of how to kind of maneuver uh, in areas like that. Um, but as I said, I'm a, I'm a criminologist. My area of study is terrorism. Uh, genocide and particularly how governments respond to terrorism uh, and I did my PhD in Australia so my central focus is the Australian and the Canadian experiences with terrorism and responses to things like 9-11. Um, that said again you can't study Canada and Australia without studying Britain so I have a, a fair bit of knowledge as well about uh, British attempts to regulate political violence uh, in Northern Ireland, um, etc. So, uh, as Bridget said, when we go to the to the groups on Monday that have very different perspectives, very different narratives, uh, we can then use that um, that experience with our students to say, you know, these are the two competing narratives. You know, how do you how do you see these narratives? How do you um, uh, how do you pull these narratives apart? How do you see how they interconnect? So we can use our experience on the very first day to, to kickstart our students in critical thinking about what's going on in Northern Ireland, which I can't do in just my classroom in Halifax. Um, I, I teach a course on uh, terrorism, I teach a course on genocide, uh, but I can't give them that, that experience, that value learning 
just in my classroom, despite my, my first-hand experience with um, both political violence and with genocide. Um, I worked in Guatemala um, with the uh, working as a liaison between the Guatemalan Department of Human Rights and the Canadian government. And we did things like go out and, and um, find mass graves and stuff like that. So I have some valuable first-hand experience that I can share, but I can't share first-hand experience that we get coming and hearing the narratives. So for me, this is an invaluable program in getting our students out of the classroom and experiencing firsthand uh, you know what northern belf or, or sorry uh, northern ireland is like what belfast is like how the communities are very different but yet they share the same goals the same concerns the same poverty etc so yeah for me i would like to see as bridget mentioned this program expanded and even networking going on between SMU and, and people at Queens and that sort of thing. So that's my, my stint. Great. Yes. Hi, uh, David Bourgeois, psychology department. Um, the fancy piece of paper says social psychology, but I teach courses in cross-cultural psychology and something called political psychology, and I do research in youth engagement. So this project sort of hits on all of those points. They, we have been doing this project for over a decade and um, we decided it was time to try to measure the impact of this experience among the participants. It's clear that spending a week away and in the um, current time frame they benefit from it, but my interest is to see if their current involvement may predict future civic and political engagement down the road. And there are different models that speak to if you are part of an organized group and you get to practice certain skills, organizational skills, group decision making, critical thinking, uh, communication skills as a young person, that helps us predict the people who are my age, those of us who are still engaged in civic outreach, those of us who volunteer at the hospital, those of us who teach minor league sports. If we understand the folks early who are part of these groups, then maybe it helps us predict the adults they will become. So we haven't done that yet. We now have 10 years of names that we can track down and maybe starting this year we can do longitudinal studies with the current students who are involved in this program. So I think there's a need to measure if this actually has a direct impact on who these young people are going to become and of course my focus is that of, of psychology. So. There's a nice mix of the different departments, the different approaches. The group has been doing applied work for over a decade. We are starting to um, develop a, an educational, um, scholarly research component to this very much applied program. But we're in the, this, is, this is my first time being part of the group, so Hopefully over the next few years we will develop uh, collaborations with researchers here as well to see if we can better understand this as an academic exercise above and beyond the applied work that is obviously useful and productive. I feel like I've got so many hats, I'm going to have to be careful to be very brief here. <laughs> so as Associate Dean Research, I'm very interested in dovetailing with what, what Dave is doing in terms of does it also make them better leaders? So I'm in the business school, although my training is as an industrial organizational psychologist, so I'm kind of on a covert op in there. And uh, I'm very interested in how this makes them better leaders. So my candidate research chair was on getting rid of toxic workplaces, basically. How do we create healthy workplaces? And I'll just give you the smallest example of, because usually when you say you want to do conflict in the business school, ironically, people kind of look at you and their eyes get a little crossed and think, why what do you care about conflict in the business school? Which is ironic because... The senior leaders that I worked with, that's what kept them up at night. 
All they were ever dealing with was how to navigate through conflict. And as Bridget was saying, we have a very diverse student body. So if you can imagine, I te teach leadership in the Masters of Technology Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program. There's a mouthful. And we have people coming from around the world. About 70% of our students are from all over the globe. And when I first get them in my class on day one, and they're in a leadership class, and they think that it's going to be one thing, and the first thing I do is sort them into diverse groups. You would think this is not a problem in Canada, right? Not so much, right? It's as though you've thrown a, a bag of Smarties on the table and they sort into colors. So you've got the Asian women and the Asian men and the African men, and the, I mean, it's just crazy. And then, of course, I proceed to use this as a teaching moment, mix them all up, and then they're really cranky. Well, by the time you're getting three quarters through the course, they realize why they need to understand diversity and conflict in order to be good leaders. And so it's, it's been a crazy experience in the business school because it has taken a, a, it's been a stretch <laughs> to, um, to kind of get them to see the value of this for leadership and how important it is that we teach our students how to navigate conflict. It is absolutely shocking how few of us ourselves included sometimes, know how to navigate that messy terrain that lies between either just walking away or engaging in dysfunction. And somewhere in between, I mean, I met Bridget because there was bullying in my daughter's school and I called her up through peaceful schools and got involved through that. I mean, it's, it's just crazy, the connections. And so few, right from children right through to the workplace, so few of us know how to successfully navigate conflict. And so I believe, and I'm passionate about the fact that students being taught leadership in a business school need to navigate conflict. And so it has been a, a very interesting experience. But I mean, the primary reason I probably was most passionate was that my grandparents came over on a boat because my grandmother was a Scotch Protestant who made the mistake of falling in love with an Irish Catholic. And that's how my family ended up in Canada. <laughs> so, so, I mean, for me, I grew up with all these crazy stories and this, you know, with the older generation, we weren't allowed to talk about religion or politics. My aunts would go loopy. So this feels a little bit like I've come full circle. It's just, it's been a crazy experience and I owe Bridget so much. I mean, what she's done at the university is amazing. So, yeah. There we go. <laughs> Uh, one something I forgot to mention was that, um, and you may recognize, John DeShastelin has been a long-standing member of our board. And when we celebrated our tenure, this is actually our thirteenth year. Uh, when we celebrated our our ten-year anniversary here, John accompanied us to Belfast. Uh, Stormont was we had a an event at Stormont with Bernardo's. We had a former partnership with Bernardo's, though that. Um, is not so necessary anymore now that we have established so many um, connections with schools on our own accord. Um, John still uh, has met all the students going this year um, and would be uh, very supportive of this approach um, in Northern Ireland uh, as one means to contribute something positive um, from our perspective. So it was very interesting to us to have him along uh, in 2014 because the people in Northern Ireland seemed to treat him like a rock star and he was welcomed and embraced everywhere we went. Um, I was particularly interested that he was really warmly welcomed um, in the Irish medium schools. They were delighted to have him there and uh, so from our perspective it was really interesting and from a Canadian perspective this afternoon Peter, uh, Supreme Justice Peter Corey, I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work around the Finucane Inquiry and, um, you know, again, another Canadian mm -hmm. that uh, often people here see as having a positive association with some of the work that we do, on the periphery anyway. <clears throat> so. Okay, should no, we open up to questions? Um, uh, not quite done. Okay. Just one <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have photos. <laughs> it's never a complete presentation unless you have good photos of uh, some of the work. So, <coughs> well, we also use, we, this year we're not, but we are also connected with a group here called Active Communities, um, which is the only cross-community effort that we have been engaged with. And this is with um, adolescents. Uh, just didn't have time in the schedule this year, but this would be a photo from last year where we did some conflict management training with them. Um, and these are just <laughs> some pictures of various schools and children. These are all local schools, local children. That was St. Kevin's School last year. You see the children. 
they're so they're, they're so engaged. <laughs> They tend to get fascinated by AR flag and, yeah. and yeah. be pictures of snow. Yeah, they, they love, love talk pictures about snow of snow a lot. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And they remember our students. Like, again, you know, to, to David's point of the time is now to start doing some more serious research mm -hmm. around the program. These children remember our students. They ask for them by name. When, so when we arrive in schools for the rest of this week, they will be asking for the St. Mary's students that they met last year. Example, that, that, this young man, he was a math student. So I've come to believe that no matter what discipline students are in, it does not necessarily um, mean that they're not great facilitators in the classroom. So you might not think a math student would be the greatest, he was fantastic. Oh, yes, and this, here we have some quotes for you, so it's important for you. So, it was a pleasure for us to host your students. They were a real credit to themselves and the university. Their enthusiasm was boundless, and they created a real buzz among the children who they were working with. The children in all four classes told me how much they enjoyed the activities they did and were able to talk about what they had learned. The teachers also related to me how much they enjoyed having their students, and they're already talking about next year. It was from our point of view, a very positive experience for our students, our pupil staff, and for your students. Please pass on my thanks to them for all their hard work. So Glenwood, so uh, we have a great relationship with Glenwood. This, is, this will be our fourth year going to Glenwood. There's Jane. <laughs> So what I have to say, so this is Jane's uh, remark from last year. The preceding year, we arrived at Cliftonville Integrated, and sitting in the staff room was a massive cake. And on the cake was the crest of St. Mary's University and the crest of Cliftonville Integrated. And that was how we were welcomed to the school. And again, the children will be asking for the St. Mary's students there tomorrow. They'll be there tomorrow. Uh, writing once again to thank you for visiting us providing such detailed and thoughtful workshops. Firstly, the St. Mary's students were a credit to your institution. They were on time, prepared, and eager for their task, engaged purposefully and politely from the beginning. They were also inquisitive about and interested in the school. I enjoyed talking to them, and they represented themselves very well. In class, they were enthusiastic and communicated effectively with different age groups. The children related well to the program. It's clear that a lot of preparation and thought went into the workshops and the students and the workshop materials were excellent. Lastly, I enjoyed engaging with you and your colleagues and sharing pedagogical theory and experiences. One of your students said that the trip for her was inspiring, and I must reply that I am inspired at the thought of these young people entering their respective professions with such a profound sense of openness and enthusiasm. And that's a pillow of steel. So who has been, we've been working with that school for many mm -hmm. years. And now we're at question. <laughs> Great. Thank, thank you all very much yes. for your contribution. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, any questions? Steve. Okay. Um, I'd be quite interested to know how do your students who go, because you're going to get like Irish language schools, mm -hmm. uh, should we say state schools and mm -hmm. integrated schools, I'm interested to know how do your students find them, I'm guessing they report back to you about what they've been doing. Mm -hmm. and how, kind of what they've heard and what they've seen. Uh, just wondering how do they find, in particular, into integrated schools? Do they find that the narratives are less polarised there, or do they mm -hmm. find that even within the integrated schools there's two different kind of groups of students who kind of keep to their own narratives? So just wondering about that. It's a good question. Um, the students are required to provide reflective reports when they return. So what we are asking them to do is to really speak from the heart. And on what they experienced. They would not be paying so much attention to those types of narratives in the integrated schools because their focus is on the children and on the workshops. They might hear something or have some discussion with some of the teachers or principals, but for the most part, they are simply trying to replicate within the schools what they have done at home. So back to Emily's point, you know, they're there to, to teach little lessons on active listening and empathy and respectful dialogue. What the children seem to like most is, you call them sketches, we call them skits. 
they act out different conflict scenarios and children are engaged at home for us in these and very much here. They're just captured by these sketches. And so there's not a lot of, I mean, they, they all reflect on things that they would see. Let's see, they might be interested in noting that there is a, an 8x10 photograph of Jerry Adams next to an 8x10 of the Pope in one school. Or what they were observing in, you know, a picture of the Queen. In a, you know, some of those types of observations would feed into um, some of their reports. But for the most part, they're writing about their experiences with the children. So it's, it's less political, really, in that way. Yeah. And we, um, we generally supervise the students in the classroom, so we, we see the, the narratives that are happening. Mm -hmm. And they generally, with, within the kids, are not, not political. The narratives are about this is so cool, and you know, do show me another picture of snow and you think like you're that, kidding? Right? They really yeah. that is their focus. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so the the kids are are actually quite unpolitical when we're in the classrooms with them. And that would be why we have never um, attempted to request any cross community efforts on the part of any of the schools here. So, of course, if we were invited to facilitate something that had already been set up and established in the form of uh, cross-community um, session, we would be willing, but that's not our place to do that. So, readiness um, of the <coughs> schools to participate in that type of activity would be paramount for us. So, that's why I think it's extremely um, meaningful that Prior to the Holy Cross situation, Holy Cross Girls School and Wheatfield Primary School, which are across the street from one another, if you know that area of the city, had a very collaborative relationship. And following the, that protest that, that has been eliminated, and now we are working with both schools independently, <coughs> not doing anything necessarily cross community again, but we are working with both schools, and, and very successfully you know, embraced by both schools. Uh, I, my son is in a primary school, Botanic Primary School, and I noticed last week he had a um, notebook marked Roots of Empathy. Yes. Um, is that your influence? I mean, I was amazed by this. Seems to have had no beneficial effect on this. <laughs> 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 That's not That's our program, but... Is that part of your program? Empathy as a teaching tool and as a subject in and of itself is, but the Roots of Empathy program is a distinct program from our program. Did it involve babies? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So bringing babies to, to schools as part of developing empathy. I think that's part of that Roots of Empathy. Is that general in the Northern Ireland educational system? Yeah, my daughter brought her baby into her husband's school. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. family, yeah. Yeah. But that's a very good point because, you know, back to the, the mission and vision for Peaceful Schools International, we do a terrible job in Canada of promoting peace education subjects within our existing curriculum. Children have all the other subjects that are standard, but we don't teach children how to respectfully engage with one another, how to deal with difficult situations, how to actively listen, all of these important interpersonal skills that are, one could argue, are easily as important as their mm -hmm. academic focus. So I think that that is central probably to your curriculum as well. It doesn't seem to exist. Bits and pieces in different schools have different programs, but nothing that is standardized. Sure. Yeah, <clears throat> when you're talking about this your own students are being with you, you define what you're trying to achieve in terms of your leadership um, <clears throat> um, um, as promoting the culture of civic activism and so on. I mean, how would you sum up what you're trying to achieve for the schools you're visiting? I mean, what is the number one aim you're hoping to achieve during the week here? There have been many occasions where people have said to me within the communities that we work with here, <clears throat> it feels as though the world has forgotten about us. And so that in and of itself, I think, helps explain um, the reception that we receive um, by the schools. Just that someone cares 
enough to contribute in some way to your post-conflict challenges. And because that connection was made early on, we felt it was important to continue it. So I think that it's, it's really it's sharing our experience, strength, and hope. So it's solidarity from our... Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And was there a reason you picked primary schools rather than older age groups to work with? There's only so many of us, and um, it's difficult to... We all have day job. You know, right? my, my main job at the university is facilitating conflict mm. management processes with faculty. So this is a great... I am leaving my university to get away from conflict to come to Belfast to escape conflict. So... Uh, um, sorry, again, your question? No. You've yeah. chosen to work with younger oh, yes, people, young, right. primary schools rather right. than older children. Is there a reason for that? Really, it's just time permitting, and the, mm. uh, uh, we seem to get a, a greater impact mm. uh, in the time frames that we have to prepare our students mm. um, with the younger children. And I say that it's, it's easier for our students to do their sketches and to maybe sing a song with children or engage them in... Um, age-appropriate ways as you become older. We worked with Boys Model here for a number of years. We did work with Boys Model. And we do have experience with older children, but it, uh, the primary schools seem to be where we have a very easy fit and are very readily accepted. Yeah. yeah and just along the same line, so I, I've heard teachers uh, telling our students that um, the workshops they give, they give the, the students certain skills to call out somebody when they're being mean or something like that. And the teachers have used some of the skills that we're teaching the kids to then, you know, put a pause on somebody being bullied or something and then pull that experience apart. So I don't think it's only the students that, that benefit from it. The right. teachers as well are picking yes. up skills that they can then use in, in interactions between the kids. And I think that's partially what we'd like to document in the future. I mean, it's we don't have data right now, so it might be a bit grandiose to say we're actually planting seeds, but I think in an ideal world, that is the goal, is the younger you plant some of those seeds and give people some skills. Um, there is some data coming out of the U.S. certainly showing that models very similar to this can make a difference in terms of the skills they actually use in the playground. Right. So we have children coming to us and saying, "I'm taking these home to my mommy and daddy and telling them this is what <laughs> this is what we learned and how to have a difficult conversation." Or so, yeah. No, I think that the last couple of questions were very interesting questions. I mean, I think there appear to be two two aspects to this course. Uh, there is sort of developing skills amongst your particular students. You're trying to develop a particular expertise in a particular in a particular area with mm -hmm. your students. Mm -hmm. However, it's about creating peaceful schools. Yes. And um, the creation of peaceful schools is not something that's done on a week's visit. Right. It doesn't happen like that's that. Right. Um, and particularly in a post-conflict situation, the creation of, of peaceful schools in a place like Northern Ireland yes. is something that is going to be quite time-consuming. Yes. So I am interested to know, apart from this week yes. that you do with the schools, where you go in and you do workshops, yes. and the children are delighted, I'm sure, yes. our children are all, I mean, I'm coming from a... In education, I taught the primary school, one of the Irish medium schools myself, the principal from one of these schools. So I'm very well aware of how, of how enjoyable ch children would find this sort of experience. Yes, but yes. at the end of the day, you know, unless you leave something or unless you support staff yes. in actually creating in a more long term way yeah. a peaceful school which also recognises the particular lack of peace right. in this part of the world, yes. I'm just wondering is it just an exercise and I don't want to say it like this but yeah, I'm going to say it like this self-indulgence mm -hmm. I think that I can um, I would suggest that that comes back to the leadership within the school so we don't go where we're not wanted we go where there is already a commitment by the school to embrace many facets of what would create a peaceful school and we're often told what they're doing um, to promote a peaceful school within their own within their own school environment, so um, that has to be there in order for our efforts to be simply complementary to what's already happening. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And I would also say, 
we all have grandiose plans and we can only work on so many projects at a time, but I do envision how I would like to track our university students through our plans to try to measure and assess what actual impact is happening with the children here that we do visit notions of networking and over a period of a decade you might create a, a network of students that we have interacted with and then here on their own could create those bonds but future plans and yeah. it would take some planning but I haven't forgotten that it also has to be about the students here and also the students that are coming from our university so it's not forgotten it's just not in the works just yet. Yeah. We also share all, freely share all of our materials with every school that we work with and would provide a, you know, a, a resource base of monthly ideas to every school that they can incorporate. We ask for feedback from our partner schools, again all of these schools that we're working with in Belfast. What are they doing? We will feature them on our website. Um, we're keen to address any uh, supportive measures that we can to help them on their journey. So, so, so the week is only one part of what you offer in the school? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Every school that we would work with would be a member of Peaceful Schools International, yeah. and again, providing them with access to, uh, to materials, resources. If we were asked to provide support for grant opportunities, we would provide a partnership in that, all kinds of different variables but yes we don't just see it as just a popping in for a week and yeah no, that's fine. That's yes fine. and partially that's where you come in I mean that's part of the reason we're here right we want to start trying to to move from this point to a point where there are as, as Dave was saying research collaborations and I mean it, it takes a lot of people to do that right yeah. and so that would be ideal is that we can reach out to the community and say yeah. how do we start to document some of this and I mean it would be I missed to say that there, there is no self-indulgence in this trip. Of course, the kids are out for pints and enjoying the social life here as well. Um, and it, when I said that I'm bad cop, I, I really tried to hammer home before we left that, yes, this is going to be fun, but we are also going into a post-conflict community who needs some respect from you and to treat this task very seriously. So we're not going into the schools flippantly, just che checking off boxes. They're actually engaging with the kids. And anecdotally, we know that we're making some difference on an individual level. And hopefully those pieces, those, those individuals, fit together in some way that will make a difference. So when you looked at the schedule of schools that we're on, these are all, except for, uh, I think we have four new schools this year because our, our group was so large. These are all long-term relationships. Some of the, the relationships with these schools are a decade old, and they expect they expect to visit every year and encourage that. And, and that's encouraging for us um, because the last thing that we want to do is to um, come in and not provide something that's significant that we can leave behind that's a benefit to the children and the schools that we're working with. No, that's fine. It's a lot clearer, and I apologize. I'm just wondering if you've had any uh, interactions with, or whether your students have had any interactions with the um, courses in conflict studies here at Queen's or in the University of Ulster, um, because there might be, it seems like there's, it's quite a new emerging discipline yes. here as well as over there, and um, there seems to be quite a lot of interdisciplinarity, which is very mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. Whether it might be also worth doing that longitudinal study that you were talking about on, on the school children and seeing. Mm -hmm. so I, I've heard of certain kids from really disadvantaged areas on the interfaces have begun to study conflict studies. They seem to be quite interested in then studying conflict studies at university level. Whether that might be something that you know draws them into it, whether your, your students end up being like role models somehow. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. last summer yeah. I met uh, some of your colleagues from the psychology department at a conference in Scotland and as it turns out they are doing research in areas that overlap nicely with projects that we want to start so this is really our first year of reaching out to peers and trying to establish a research component to what was essentially an applied program so 
we're right in the beginning and this is why we're here and so I assume that things will uh, sort of develop after uh, after this week but I so for instance I didn't know that and now I know that so that's good and I'm glad someone's <laughs> writing it down because <laughs> I will forget yeah that's exactly what we're hoping yeah. yes, Tim. I was just interested in the if we can go back across the board in the Canadian experience and, and uh, Forgive my ignorance, but uh, is there tension? For example, if you're a school kid in Quebec, uh, is there tension between French Canadian kids and those who don't regard themselves in French, as French Canadian? I'm not so how's that? How's that managed? Here's our French Canadian kid. I I was raised in the province of New Brunswick, which is the only official bilingual province in Canada, in a city that had 60%. Anglophone and 40% Francophone. And I can tell you as a junior high student, there was Besbro School and there was George Vanier School and the kids would meet up in the church parking lot because it was halfway between each and we would get into fisticuffs, right? So there is tension there, but I would say that it is uh, significantly different and not as extreme as what I would imagine it is here. Um, there are divides. There is us versus them, but uh, there's not a history of armed conflict and, and death and violence. It's more of a low-key punch to the face. So, uh, But I don't know, maybe 100 years ago that was stronger. It yeah. seems to have dissipated yes. somewhat as mm. education levels increase across our country and there's upward mobility, uh, there's less of that uh, sort of clan tension, at least in the city where I grew up. It's not yeah. as bad as it used to be. It really, there's a generational effect going on because, I mean, so Dave was out in the east, I was in the far other end out in the west in Alberta. And it was the same thing. There was the Catholic junior high and the Protestant junior high. And for some reason, we did. And it was the same thing. It was a field in the middle and everything. But they, but the, we had no idea. None of it made any sense, right? It was so far removed. And now, if you were to say to my daughter, who just finished going through the public school system, about this notion of Catholics versus Protestants, she wouldn't even know what you're talking about. It, it's it, there is this real dilution through the generations, so that. Sure. Yeah, again, much like in my own family, where literally you brought up religion or politics and my aunts visibly went ballistic. Whereas those of us that have been raised in Canada, there was like 21 of us cousins, and we just didn't get it. Like, we just, we didn't get it, right? Because it was, again, it was just sort of the, the time removed. Yeah. yeah we, we do have a, a history of, of um, uh, armed struggle within the, the French community in Quebec with the October crisis of 1972, 74. Yeah, um, but it was a very short period of time and it was met very quickly afterwards with the implementation of our Charter of Rights, which addressed a lot of the issues that were yeah. brought up by the FLQ. So our, <laughs> our experience with political violence was very short and therefore our relationship between Anglophone and Francophone is much better, mm -hmm. I would argue, because of the work together, like working together in achieving the Charter of Rights. Um, so yeah, it, it still does exist. Um, Quebec is very protective of the French language, for example. All signs in Quebec have to be in French. There's very little tolerance for, for English, um, but it's, it's accepted in Canada as necessary. Yeah, because we have diversity issues. I mean, so, so I mean, as much as we're saying it's peaceful in Quebec, in a sense, their struggle currently, please correct me if I'm wrong because I'm out of my domain oh, here. Oh, I will. But I know you will. <laughs> but, I mean, it would be more around diversity and, and what is acceptable if you're adhering to the Muslim religion, for example, right? So there's, there's a different pressure on us in terms of visible minorities and also in terms of religion and what is considered appropriate in government offices and things like this. So... It, I mean, it gets complicated really fast, but but yeah. it's more of a diversity issue. If Different means. shades of conflict. Yes. But there yes. still is conflict. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just a quick question related to what's been said already. Does it relate anything to the shared education agenda? I, I, I've got that right. 
right term because I don't fully understand it, but it's, I think our school of education, yes. the shared education, yes. as I understand the label, is recognising the limits of integrated education, it's getting schools collaborating far more yes. without disestablishing schools, as it were, because of the politics around that. Yes. And at least what you're doing seems to suggest that you've got a hell of a lot of principals who are very like-minded yes. that would, would tally with that. So surely that's an area where with our school of education that it would, would um, like I say, I don't, probably people can correct me that if that's what it is, shared education as well, saying that's what it's about, it's about saying, okay, without closing some schools, what yes. can we at least get right. far more sharing language facilities or sports facilities or whatever it is, yes. and surely that's yes. something that would very much tally with what you, you guys are doing. Yes, it, it, it would, and just by virtue of my setting up new school connections, it's very easy now to ask one principal who's had an experience with our program to provide a positive reference to another principal who is just as keen. And so that's how we, that's how we roll. Um, Bridget, you, the Peaceful Schools International operates mm -hmm. in other countries as well, you have projects uh, in other post-conflict societies. Yes, there have been, yes. Uh, is there any interaction between the, the kind of Belfast project and, and what the organization is doing elsewhere? Uh, no, there would not. These would have been defined projects in Sierra Leone, okay. Pakistan. Um, uh, you, where else? Serbia. Um, so because we are very, really a very small nonprofit, um, all of these projects would have been dependent on different Canadian grants, again, fundraising initiatives, ways to get students, um, to these countries, and some of these were not directly connected to our St. Mary's students, but were projects that were undertaken by the organization. We focused primarily, our focus primarily has always been uh, Northern Ireland. Our office is a banker's box. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, yes. So, um, kind of a, uh, a question on the academic side. Most of us didn't join a paramilitary organization here. Yet an awful lot of the studies is talking to people who did, why they did it. And we mentioned the narratives mm -hmm. that they have. And we go through a process where effectively a lot of them asked to be re-narrated based mm. upon different from my experience of it. And I think, well, that's nonsense, but that's becoming the norm. But my question is, where do you put a control in place where, where you say, well, all right, you decided to shoot someone or bomb someone or do this or do that, but these people over here, most of them didn't. Why didn't they do it from that perspective? So how do you try and uh, uh, end up assuming that all those people who did that stuff, and they were very much a minority, and that, that the whole story becomes about them and what they did as opposed mm -hmm. to yeah, that's a great most of us who did. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. You can ask that in two seconds, that would be great. Go. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. But I think one of the yeah, things one of the things that we do is we, we we debrief the students after we have events like today where we talk to those groups. And we, we at least I do, I try to put that experience in context. And then we also encourage the students to talk to cabbies, talk to people that you meet in the pubs, get a real sense from other people of how they view Belfast. Not the cabbies, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Most of them have died at home. Yeah, yeah. That's true, yeah. But that's where but we, you come in, yeah. right? I mean, that's exactly where we're kind of in this next phase, right? And that's exactly where all of you come in, and then even beyond that. Because I think, yeah. and much like in organizations, we always start with the equivalent of combatants, right? And then eventually we realize there's a lot of bystanders, there's a lot of people who are involved, yeah. and there's also people who are supporting the opposite in a peaceful way. Yeah. So I think that yeah. is the next phase. I think absolutely. I think it's just yeah. uh, emanating from this core. Because our, our students are constantly meeting bystanders who tell them stories about not being involved. Yeah. Yeah. So they bring those stories back to us and... The, you know, that, that adds context to their experience here. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Do they get do they get any of the history of Ireland? Yes. Is yes. history part yes. of it in the history of so when yes. they come here they already have some firm grasp of 
history. Yes, if, you do. if they're not sleeping during my lectures, yes. yes. Ah. yes. <laughs> we work very closely yeah. with, um, who would be a colleague of, of Beers, um, uh, Dr. Padre Gauchel, mm -hmm. who is the chair of our Irish Studies Department, and um, he would provide lecturing uh, mm -hmm. to the students on, again, his perspective. Um, he's from Derry. Um, and then we would the students have an, an option to take a course that I would teach in political science cross-listed with Irish studies um, on peace and politics in Northern Ireland. So we do our very best. Mm -hmm. Because they are coming from all three faculties, it's a, it's a bit of a challenge to make sure that they're brought up to speed on as much as they need to know. And as you already know, it's very complicated. So acronyms alone um, can take a long time. Sure. So we do our very best to make sure that they understand as much as they need to know in order to function effectively while and, they're here. And they also meet weekly if it's not about fundraising. There's various speakers who come in on Friday afternoons when everybody else gets to start their weekends. Our students are meeting late Friday afternoons and getting lectures from different faculty members of different departments talking about various issues that we feel may have a direct or indirect impact on their understanding of this area, but also what they are required to do for the week that they are here. So we try to prepare them as, as best as possible for this endeavor. So we have an Irish, we always have um, uh, an Irish language instructor um, that provides some form of an internship. I think it's through the ICUF. Is that a familiar term? Irish Canadian University Fund. So someone who comes and teaches our Irish language courses. And um, so he, you know, this year came and spoke to the students and explained various issues surrounding the Irish language issues and, yeah, provided them with his perspective. So we do our best. Brian? I think it's great the work that you're doing, but I, I'm slightly confused about the way you see us. Um, and do your students think they're coming to a conflict zone or to a post-conflict society? On on some level, yes, yes, because of the um, the history of Belfast, we have to educate them on um, the conflict and how it's affected um, Belfast today. But, uh, are we, in a, are we a post-conflict society or not? And if so, when did the conflict stop? <laughs> well, I, I don't know if you're a post-conflict society. Yeah. I don't... You actually use the title. Yeah. 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 We can't decide yeah. ourselves, Brian. Right? Yeah. We can't decide ourselves, Brian. We can't decide ourselves, Brian. Yeah. We can't decide ourselves, can we? But, but you use the term people with all due respect, and it's in the title of the presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's what would an you assumption suggest? that this is a post-conflict society, yeah. and is it a warranted mm -hmm. assumption? You know what, I, I see evidence that, that it is post-conflict, and I see evidence that it's not, that the conflict is still going on. For God's sakes, there was a pipe bomb thrown at a house this morning. So we, so, we track. <laughs> we, we have to, for yeah. liability reasons. You can imagine many of our students, parents, yeah. are concerned that we are taking them to Belfast. So, and, and along those lines, how do you, how do you decide if you're a, if you're a, a post-colonial society? It's like, where do you yeah. draw that discussion line? It's It's... Infinitely more complex than than we've yeah. we've but it's dealt to do with. The yeah. nature of conflict, isn't it? I mean, have you yeah. ever been to a post-conflict school? In other words, a school that's free of conflict. Uh, yes. hmm. yeah. I w I would posit that most of our students are just. I think they understand broadly where they're going, but for many of them, the task is to teach little kids about peace. And harmony, so independent about navigating of conflict, as you said. Yes. yes, right. But independent. I think many of our students are only vaguely aware of politics. I think it's really at the human level. Can this person get along with this person, independent of the geography or the politics? It's yeah. it's really yeah. at the human level, and I think most of them are operating on that, independent of geography. And that's that's actually a good point. I don't know if we mentioned this or not, but our students also give the same workshops in, in Canadian schools. So your students are learning the exact same skills that Canadian students are learning in how to deal with interpersonal conflict. So it's it's on different. that yeah, it's on that apolitical level. It's about, you know, not bullying people and yeah. not spreading rumors and, and things like that. So. And I can tell you how crazy that gets in terms of when you start stretching it, because the lecture I actually give the students, 
I'm coming from the perspective of a psychologist, and I'm talking about what's happening in their brain in terms of the biology when you're in a conflict situation, yeah. right? And about amygdala hijacks and crazy stuff that they never thought they were going to be learning about. You know, probably they took Bridget's course in poli sci. So it's really about. I mean, Dave put it very well in terms of the human interactions because unfortunately we're all human, <laughs> so we're going to be subject to certain rules, much like gravity, and and you know just even teaching them about their prefrontal cortex and giving time to you know process things. I mean, so often, especially in schools, there's we all we, we're no different in organizations, yeah. right? We react, and so I know this sounds crazy, but even with my graduate students, I can't tell you the the stories I hear and the epiphanies and the things they come and say to me how it's changed their life because they figured out that they're prefrontal cortex needs time to kick in. I mean, it sounds silly, I know, but just figuring out they had to give themselves that deep breath and that they don't have to have a conflict. I'm and these are business students. I'm right? interested in how you would define it. Define? How, how, what term you would use? I think we're wrestling with it. We don't. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not a... I think it's very dangerous to... I mean, one of the, things, the traps that we've fallen into is that we've proclaimed this place as a post-conflict society, mm. and we're just approaching the 20th anniversary yes. of the Good Friday Agreement, mm. and all sorts of... Um, well, I think there's a lot of people coming, wanting to come and take pride in the success of that, but it's very difficult at the moment to point to the evidence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Two, yeah. two things yeah. on that. We struggle with the same thing in Canada. Yeah. Most Anglophones would say, absolutely, we're post-conflict. Absolutely. Ask an Aboriginal community. Yeah. It's completely different perspective. Yeah. Second thing I would say, yeah, yeah oh, second yeah. thing, <clears throat> excuse me, second thing I would say is that this is exactly why we need networking. This is exactly why we need to develop relationships with you guys so that we can be part of this conversation and learn about how to speak about Belfast and how to speak about Northern Ireland. Yeah. Because Does we're it not follow that if your students provide a valuable service by coming here, that students from here could provide an equally valuable service. That would be amazing. Canada. And we would love that. That would be amazing. <laughs> we would be at your door yeah. tomorrow morning. We, I mean, that would be amazing. We do have some students that come across as uh, as exchange students, but nothing in the same way uh, that we're, we're sending students here. But You could replicate our model? Absolutely. Easily. But there have, yeah. there have yeah. been numerous programs in the past, right from the 70s onwards. Mm -hmm. That have sought to do that, take small groups. Of no, this is technique. It's a shame. I don't know if you've got time to demonstrate a skit for us, but <laughs> the skill that's. Yes. It's, this is a skills based program. Yes. You're yeah. teaching yes. skills. Yes, yeah. we are teaching skills. Yes, very yes. much. Yes. I've been acting for an over an hour now. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, it's a skills based program. Exactly, exactly. And what's ironic about it is. The same skills that we are teaching are the same ones I'm trying to impart with faculty. Absolutely. My work. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. ridiculous. There's it's nothing exactly that's really that different. Yes, there's no yeah. such thing as a post conflict university. <laughs> no. no. If you, I, I, I would apply. If you, if you, I'll talk to you after. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Come to the wrong <laughs> but, but like, a, like I said, interested in that conversation. <laughs> like I said, these, these are the avenues that we would like to open so that we can start developing relationships where you bring students over to us. So it's not just this one-way experience. I, I think that would be invaluable. Again, the, the, you know, some of the key principles to bear in mind, though, are accessibility. Yeah. Um, not just financially, but also we're very mindful of students who may have uh, various disabilities, uh, supporting students in traveling that way. Um, and a non-prescriptive approach. <coughs> to the facilitation of this peace education program. So we'd be happy to share every bit of our model with you and would be delighted. And Canadian children would be really excited by yeah, Northern no Irish students. Absolutely. Say access, yeah, yeah. love it. Well, any further questions? Well, thank you all for giving your time. Uh, it's a very busy week. Um, yes. and you've well, We've seen a busy week. schedule. Yes. <laughs> schedule. Uh, so we really appreciate that you find the time to come and engage.